Hey everyone, welcome to the GeoTrek podcast. We're on podcast number 32. I've been getting a lot of positive feedback about the last two podcasts, both recorded at the EVAN 2022 conference in Orlando, Florida. This conference focused on quantifying the likeliness of extreme weather and water, like hurricanes, coastal flooding, and sea level rise. The day after the conference ended, I recorded this podcast with Dr. Ivan Haig at a place called Kelly Park in Central Florida. Sometimes you'll hear typical park sounds in the background, like kids playing in the water. Ivan Haig is an associate professor in coastal oceanography within the School of Ocean and Earth Science at University of Southampton, based at the National Oceanography Center Southampton in the United Kingdom. He's passionate about all things related to sea level. Dr. Haig and his team investigate variations in sea level from time scales of seconds like water waves to days like tides and storm surges to long-term century scale rises in mean sea level and its impact on the coast so that's like longer term sea level rise they look at that as well in the last 12 years he has worked on a wide range of projects in both industry and academia covering many aspects of coastal coastal oceanography with a particular focus on sea level rise and coastal flooding. Hey, before we get to the podcast, we wanted to ask a favor. If you could please subscribe to this podcast. If you like what GeoTrek produces, you wanna hear us stay on the air, your subscription actually makes a big difference. It's a big way, it's a big metric that we use for monitoring progress, and it helps us to make professional partnerships moving forward. Well, without waiting any longer, let's get into this podcast with Dr. Ivan Haig. I think it's a, gr- it's a great one that you're really going to enjoy. Hey everyone with the GeoTrek podcast. We have an exciting episode today. We're here at the EVAN 2022 conference. It's a conference on extreme value theory and uh, really looking at extremes in weather and oceanography. I'm with Dr. Ivan Haig from the UK. He came over to Florida for this conference here and uh, we just were floating in some springs here in central Florida. The conference was held in Orlando over the last three days and we're going to have a little chat here. Ivan, thank you so much for coming on the GeoTrek podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure. How really, really good to be with you. Ivan, in the conference, they said uh, this is the fifth international conference for the EVAN conferences. They said, has anyone been here for all five? And you were the only person. <laughs> so you, you've been here for, for these five conferences, huh? Yeah, no, it's quite humbling, actually, to think I'm the only person who's been to all five. So, yeah, no, I love them. So we held the first conference in 2012, I think it was, 2011, maybe, in Germany. Then we then we moved to Spain two years later. Then I hosted the third conference in Southampton. Um, and then we had another one in Paris, this one in Orlando. So I've been, you know, involved um, in sort of organising, well, hosting the Southampton one, but helping to organise the other ones as well. So, yeah, I love this conference series, really passionate about it. Um, yeah. Ivan, I met you through this conference series in Siegen, Germany. I remember yeah. that conference really well. It was a successful conference. There were a lot of great presentations. But uh, you and I kind of connected about yeah. some things, our love for nature and oceanography. And also, um, we've both lived sometimes, you've spent uh, much more time than I have in Africa. I, yeah. I lived there for just a couple of years. But I was I was shocked uh, to hear that you grew up in Africa, actually. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, just before we talk about Africa... Um, yeah, it's always nice when you go to conferences and meet people. But um, yeah, I, it's been you know amazing getting to know you over the last sort of ten years. And yeah, it's sort of funny to think we met back at, at an Evan conference. But yeah, so I was born in in Africa in 1979. I was born in Zambia, a very very remote part of Zambia, so the sort of northwest province, right on the source of the, the sort of very famous Zambezi River that goes into Victoria Falls. So um, yeah, I, I was born there, and I I lived there for around 19, 20 years but before moving to the UK. So your your parents had lived there, right? Were your parents both British? And the, but... Yeah, so my parents were British. My dad moved to Zambia in the 60s, so he's lived in Zambia more than uh, almost 70 years. Not so, uh, sort of, yeah, 65, 70 years. Um, and then I think he lived there for 10 years and then came back on furlough, met my mum, married my mum. And, you know, my mum was incredibly brave, sort of going to this, um, you know, remote country, no electricity where we were no running water you know it's a very sort of basic uh, basic lifestyle well, i learned a little bit more about it this week you showed me some videos of you flying in with your wife and your daughter now to yeah. show your daughter where you grew yeah, up and it yeah. was incredibly remote yeah, you were flying yeah. in on a bush plane right well you you get to the capital lusaka and then there is a tar road to the copper belt it takes about six or seven hours to get to the copper belt which is where all the copper mines are and then from there um it's it, it used to be um, there wasn't a tar road, 
so we from there we would um, we would have to drive sort of ten hours on uh, dirt, uh, dirt dirt roads to to sort of get home. So it, and it's very hot as well. So normally you'd sort of leave at three or four in the morning. So we would you know if you get into Lusaka we would break it up and sort of take two or three days uh, to sort of travel. So it's, it's very remote. And even the tar roads themselves are terrible. They're just full of potholes. So, you know, in in the US, Europe, you know, you you would you drive sort of 100 miles an hour. But even on some of the dirt, dirt tar roads there, you, you're driving 20, 30 miles an hour just because the, the quality of the rugged. roads are so bad and and does a lot of damage to your car as well, you know. Yeah, so. pretty rugged. It sounds like pretty remote. Yeah. Um, when you're in the remote part of, say, South Central Africa, you're inland, if you break down or have problems, are there issues with your safety or are people generally pretty friendly if you come across people there? So part of the journey goes, um, I mean, so... A lot of the tribe where we live are really beautiful, lovely, friendly people where you're relatively safe. Um, but part of the drive goes along the Congo border and there was a big sort of civil war there. So there was a 10 year period when we would never drive alone. We would um, we would deliberately sometimes wait for days um, and go in a convoy with other families. So we would sometimes have sort of 10 cars going in convoy and we'd, we would, you know, uh, several of the cars would, would would take guns, you know, to protect ourselves. So we were we were very, very lucky. We, we've never been, uh, but some of our closest friends have been held hostage, you know, on that road. They were dri- driving, gunmen came, um, took them out of the car, tied them to a tree, took all of their belongings and drove off, you know. So there has been some... Like, um, like they say, safety in numbers, I guess, the, yeah, the more yeah. you have it with your group. Yeah. The Where I grew be. up was very safe, but but the journey there yeah. sometimes could be quite treacherous. I also saw these videos of the waterfalls near where you yeah. grew up. There, it looked like a beautiful place to grow up and spend time in nature. Huh? Yeah, so w- where we are is, uh, you know, it's a really, really beautiful part of Zambia, very wild. But w- we were lucky in that the government, um, uh, my dad did a lot of training. So he he had a carpentry shop. He taught building. Where we are, the Zambians are incredibly poor. You know, if you have a bicycle, you're wealthy. Um, so the government gave us a sort of thousand hectares of land. So you know, three or four thousand acres. And so we had this amazing, beautiful bit of land. But it, my dad always wanted to find it. So he spent two years just walking through the bush, and came across this amazing site with waterfalls. And the government sort of gave us the gave us the land. So yeah, we have a, a really nice river called the Nyangombi running through the site we've got two beautiful stretches of waterfalls that you can swim in and i mean it's absolutely idyllic place to kind of grow up and that's amazing so yeah it seems like you spent a lot of time in nature just today we were floating in these springs and i think it brought back some memories to you you said oh we grew up doing this in oh yeah no so we you know my dad would when we were home from the school holidays we went to boarding school he would blow up the car tires for us and we'd float down the river on these car tires kind of like we were doing today but in a very different setting like that um what you're, you're such a successful scientist growing up did you have a love for science did you did you picture yourself being a professional scientist one day? I mean, talk a little bit about, say, getting into your teenage yeah. years and and the thoughts of academics and what you want to do going forward. Yeah, so I was I was to be honest with you, I was never particularly academic. Um, I never found I was very dyslexic. I never found school particularly easy. I, I was very very good at maths, but um, but other than that, um, so I if I'm honest with you, I genuinely had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, almost up until university, I I really didn't know. Quite a few of my cousins and uncles were architects, and I thought maybe I'd like to be an architect, and then I realised I wasn't a very good drawer. So I never really knew what I wanted to do. Never, I've always loved nature, was outside a lot, but I never, I didn't really, I don't even think I really knew what a scientist was back then. Um, so so yeah. walk us through then when you start university. I mean, how, how did this path go for you? You know, and it's yeah. an unusual path. You grew up in Africa. Yeah. I think you were looking at university options in the UK. Um, how did that look in, yeah. in your late teens? So, I mean, I, I, I loved I loved Zambia. I wanted to stay in Zambia. You know, we, although we were, although I was British, I didn't feel British. Um, and we came over to England about once every three or four years to visit relatives. But I never particularly liked England never really wanted to live there but my parents were always adamant that they wanted me to go to an English university I didn't really want to I I wanted to go to South Africa but my sort of parents persuaded me that you know I should go back to England for, for university and and to be honest with you I had genuinely no idea what to study and we in Zambia I think we had I remember having one career day but um 
So in the end, I think with discussions with my parents, we thought maybe I could do something like civil engineering and maybe that would give me an opportunity to come back to Africa and sort of be an engineer. Uh, so in the UK, you, you, are, you don't apply to a university, you apply to an organisation called UCAS, which oversees all of the universities. And you, you basically have to fill in a form where you list your six choices of, of courses. It could be six course programmes at the same university or six different universities. Like six disciplines, like, like civil engineering, maybe one of them. No, I mean, you, you, could, you could have... Um, so I, I had six choices. So I, five of my choices were civil engineering degrees. So I had, for example, I had a civil engineering degree in Portsmouth University, civil engineering degree in Bath. Um, see, those are different of your, of your six choices. Yeah, so you okay, have to, ev- every, every student in the UK has to choose six. And mostly you'll get your first choice. If you get the, you have to, and different degrees, you have to get certain grades to be able to get into that program. So I had five of them, and I, I remember sitting at skidding at school, filling in the paperwork, and I didn't know what to do for my sixth choice. But I'd always been quite good at maths, so my dad said, well, "Why don't you, you know, think about a maths degree?" But I didn't really want to do an entire maths degree. And just by chance, I was looking through the brochure, and there was a course at Southampton called Oceanography with Maths. And once every year, we had driven down to South Africa to Durban, where my uncle lived, and I just Zambia is a landlocked country. But we had spent a week every year driving down to South Africa. We spent about a month of the summer holidays in South Africa on the beach. And I just always loved the sea. So I Durban's thought, right there in the Indian Ocean, right? Durban's in the Indian Ocean. So I thought, well, well, why don't, you know, something like Oceanography and Mass. I didn't expect to do it. It was just my kind of sixth choice. And then in um, the year before I was, I was halfway through doing my A-levels in the UK, we... we you do high school and then you do two years of A-levels before. I guess it's a bit similar to college in the US. But we we flew over to England and my dad um, drove me to each of the five. You know, I think I had degree. I had chosen degrees in five universities. So my dad spent a week and we... I had a really good time with my dad. I actually remember it quite well. Sort of, But we drove to each of the universities and some of them we tied it in with official open days. Um, but I remember I went to... I went to Bath University, I went to Portsmouth, I went to Plymouth to the civil engineering degree. But I just, I, I don't know, I i just felt that this wasn't for me for some reason. I just felt, although the courses looked really interesting, I, I just, I, I don't know, I just sort of thought, I, I don't want to do civil engineering. It, it's just not It didn't really not spark for a me. passion with no, you. No, there's just get something, about something it. in me. And then it's funny, sort of, I guess, fate in, in a way, but we went to Southampton University and it, I think the other universities we visited had been rainy days, but Southampton was this beautiful sunny day. Southampton's got lots of parks, so I kind of, growing up in the, in the bush, I quite like just, you know, there's lots of parks, it was quite a green city, beautiful day, and we visited the Oceanography Centre, which is not on the main campus, that so you've got the main campus, but the Oceanography Centre sort of, you know, five miles, six, seven kilometres away, but we drove there, but it's right on the waterfront. It's a really impressive building. It's one of the, the three biggest oceanography centres in the world. There's a boat outside, and I just walked through the door, and within about three minutes of going through this door, I was like, you know, cutting-edge building, I just want to work here. Was it just a sense, like, this is where I want to yeah, be? Yeah, it was just a sense of... And I, I honestly knew nothing about oceanography. I, you know, I, I, I didn't have even a clue what it was. Um, but I did, I did a three-year degree, and I just fell in love with it right from the beginning. I just loved the, loved the program. I loved. So the, the degree was in oceanography. Degree was in uh, uh, oceanography with maths. So yeah. I sort of, so I focus more oceanography. You know, you you've got you've got kind of four strands of oceanography. You've got marine biology studying. You've got the kind of chemistry of the ocean. You've got the sort of physics, the climate. So yeah, so I, I just sort of fell in love with the program, fell in love with the degree, and and. Yeah, just what a just, great setting right there, right? Yeah. I mean, you're right on the water. Yeah, um, Southampton's where the Titanic left from, right? Yeah, yeah. So the building where I'm based in, the work working is just across from where the Titanic sailed. And if you're ever in Southampton, there's a really good sort of Titanic museum. We I went with my daughter a few yeah. months. What back a great and, setting! You're right yeah. there on the water. You yeah. know, for for the oceanography work yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it sounds like undergrad really worked out well, you know, even in the, in this field that you didn't know much about going in. What about, I know for a lot of our listeners that are say in college, sometimes those, the end of your college years can be a little bit stressful because you're like, well, what do I do next? I mean, uh, what yeah. was that like for you as you were finishing up university? I, 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 I think I was quite naive. I, I, um, I didn't really think about sort of work. I just sort of enjoyed the three degree program and towards the end of my program, I, I really didn't have a sort of clear path of 
you know where, where I was going to go. But one of the professors sent her out an email about a job in a sort of engineering, not an uh, sort of environmental engineering consultancy, and they were looking for someone with sort of expertise in coastal oceanography. And so I applied for the job and I went for an interview, but I didn't get it because I still had six months of the degree left and they wanted someone to start straight away. And I came towards the end of my degree, honestly, having no idea. And I, I yeah, had no idea what I wanted to do. But the company phoned me, actually sent me an email saying, oh, we really liked you. And uh, there's another role coming up we think you'd be good at. So in a way, I was incredibly lucky, incredibly blessed that I sort of, yeah, um, came straight into this job straight after university. And this job was right there in Southampton in the private sector, right? Yeah, so it's the private sector. So it, it was a it was a small company. There's about 30 people, but it was owned by a, a much, much bigger company called Associated British Ports. Associated British Ports have about 20 ports around the country. And so this company, um, probably 50% of the work this company did was for the ports. So they did a lot of sort of oceanography, dredging, um, but then 50% of it was sort of government projects, um, other private um, consultancy. So I did a lot of work on the oceanography around offshore wind farms, dredging. And it was then that I started to do a lot of work on sort of flooding. I did a okay. number of projects for the UK Environment Agency on sort of flooding. Did they do some work with infrastructure, seawalls, dikes, things like that? Yeah, well? so we did a lot of... Um, we we I was in the numerical modelling team, so a lot of my work was um, modelling you know, new breakwater designs, port designs, uh, assessing the impact of a a, a structure in the ocean. And we also had a big 3D physical modelling. So we had this huge hangar, a bit like an aircraft hangar. And in there, we could actually build a sort of three-dimensional model and we had wave paddles. So we'd build a stretch of coastline with a seawall and we'd pump waves at, you know, one-tenth the size. And um, so it's a a really quite a cool place to work. It sounds like uh, you got really... um you know, exposed to a lot of these different issues in yeah. coastal flooding and environment, um, getting a lot of experience there. Sounds like it was a good experience for you, but then you ended up uh, getting back into academia after that, right? Yeah, so the first two years, I really, really loved the job because I just got a lot of, I learned a huge amount. I, you know, worked on some really interesting projects. And then after two years, I got promoted to what's called a consultant where I was taking the lead on projects up until then. And I really enjoyed that for another two years because I was speaking to clients and and bidding for work and I was sort of overseeing the projects but after four years I really loved it but I I got a bit fed up in that I was really loving the kind of flooding studies but then the money from the client would finish and I'd find some really interesting and I just wanted to go further but the client kind of got what they what they wanted you had this curiosity and I kind of had this curiosity I wanted to go a bit deeper and and so I'd spoken to someone I to be honest with you I don't even think I really knew what a PhD properly was at the time but I spoke to someone and they had done a PhD with a professor in Southampton called Robert Nichols on sort of flooding and and she she said to me oh you should go and speak to Robert Nichols so I and Robert Nichols he, he's pretty famous around Robert, the world right? I, I didn't know at the time I didn't know who he was <laughs> and it, in fact it, it wasn't until even halfway during my PhD that I realized he was a sort of world leading scientist but I had a coffee with Robert Nichols in the university staff club and I was very very lucky actually because um, engineering had a lot of funding for PhD students but he said well what do you want to do and I sort of said oh, I want to do something on flooding and sea level rise and over half an hour we sort of mapped out this project and at the end he said um, yeah I'll take you on and I'll fund you and this and was so back in Southampton, yeah? This was in Southampton, okay. yeah. So I handed in my notice at work, but my wife and I then spent uh, six months travelling around the world. We were supposed to go for a little bit longer, nine months. Yeah, so we in the end we went up for six months. Uh, we had to come home early. So the world trip was before you started your graduate school? Is yeah, right? so I okay. worked for this company for four years. Then I took. I was. I was going to take a year off to then travel the world before starting the PhD. Ivan, before we get into your PhD <laughs> uh, at GeoTrek, we love talking about travel and we love talking about extremes in weather and disasters. And you sh- you shared a story at this conference in December of 2004. You were in Thailand. For yeah. a lot of our listeners, may or may not be familiar with the tremendous tsunami that yeah, hit the day yeah. after Christmas, and uh, you were in some of those places that were devastated just a few days before the tsunami hit. Yeah, right? we spent about six weeks weeks in Thailand and Malaysia and we spent um, two weeks we spent well we spent one week on the east coast of Thailand but then we spent I think another couple of weeks on the west coast of Thailand and this is in that nine month Um, trip around the world this was in the nine month trip around the world and in particular what was really funny is we went to an island called Koh Phi Phi uh, which has a really low-lying sandbar that's just full of about 100 hotels and 
I sat on the beach and it's a very, very sort of big, wide, shallow beach. And I remember thinking that if a tsunami ever hit here, um, you know, this place would be flattened. And I, I said to my wife, you know, I wonder if they've ever had tsunamis here. My wife didn't even know what a tsunami was. A lot of people in the world didn't know what a tsunami was. And that night we went to a restaurant and I was speaking to a dive instructor and said, do you ever get tsunamis here? And he didn't know what a tsunami was. And he's a dive instructor. And he's a dive instructor, yeah. And so we were there just before Christmas 2004, wasn't it? And we actually, we, we had a round the world ticket, but with no set dates. But one of my friends from New Zealand contact, we were supposed to go to New Zealand yet, but we, we, we had planned to spend Christmas in Thailand. But one of my friends said, well, why don't you come over a bit early and spend Christmas with us in New Zealand? And so we actually flew over to New Zealand just a few days before. So you were planning to be in Thailand where the tsunami hit, but this, this change of plans, you went to New Zealand. Yeah, instead. we went to New Zealand. And so we we spent a few days with my friend and then um, he lent us his car and we wanted to go to the north. There's a very famous called the Bay of Islands. So we drove up to the Bay of Islands and we were camping for a few days and we had no internet connection, no nothing. And so it wasn't until the 25th or the, 20, the 27th, I think, we drove back into town to fill up the car because we'd been camping quite remotely. And I saw a TV out the corner of my eyes and I just saw these pictures of this sort of massive wave. And I asked the lady at the desk, you know, what happened? And she didn't speak very good in English. She just said, a big wave, a big wave. And you didn't know and where I in the d- world this was. I didn't know anything about this. And we, we then... I didn't think about it, but we went went to a petrol station, filled up, filled up the car, and I saw all of the newspapers were about a tsunami. And so, yeah, we, you know, thankfully, you know, just just missed it because we almost no doubt we we would have been in, you know, and a week was, before we would have been in in uh, an area that would have been absolutely devastated. These were the devastated. days before mobile phones, right? So we didn't have any just, mobile phones. We yeah, we people went. People use internet cafes. Right? Yeah, yeah. So when you went to the internet cafe, opened up your email. Uh, what, what did you find there? Well, we yeah. So we we'd been going about six weeks, and we, we'd only gone to an inter- internet cafe about once a week, and the internet was super slow in Thailand. So we'd go to this internet cafe and check our emails, and most you know. Up until that point, we'd only had two or three emails from mainly my wife's mum, you know, just asking how we were. Um, and then we went to the email cafe that we went to the internet cafe that day, and we had about 150 emails. And it was starting with, you know, are you all right? Are you in Thailand? Where in the world are you? And then friends started emailing other friends, but copying in us and us going, you know, do you know where Ivan and Fiona are? I think they're in Thailand. No one's heard from them. And everyone was like really so people genuinely. People thought you might have well, been people, hit by that Yeah. Tsunami. People generally were really worried about us and sort of thought we, we might be caught up in it. Or Yeah, it really was a close call. And it probably made that tsunami much more personal for you because you had just met people like that dive instructor and yeah. other people. You were just there. Well, a when few you're traveling before. around the world and staying in youth hostels, you know, you meet a lot of people. So we met a, a, a really nice, we met a couple of really nice um, younger lads who we had sort of spent two or three days with exploring various islands with. And and it's the sort of days before phones, so we didn't take their contact details. But one of them, I, I know for a fact, at least one of them was going to be on Co PP over Christmas. So it's really we we don't know. You know, he might well have died. We 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 don't know. Yeah, it takes. Um, you know, we heard about the horrific numbers of deaths, but if you don't have a personal connection, yeah, and it's just yeah, numbers for yeah. you. You were just there, so um, it, I'm, I'm sure that had a personal impact for you. Yeah. And, and you and Fee were very uh, fortunate to yeah, have no, left there very, right yeah. before it hit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you did this amazing trip around the world with your wife Fiona, and then back to Britain to start your PhD, right? Yeah. So yeah, we we travelled. Southeast Asia. We went to New Zealand for two months. We went to Australia for four months, and then we were supposed to spend another three months traveling through Fiji, Hawaii, the U.S. But unfortunately, my wife's father got very ill, so we we had to come home early. Um, so we we're in the U.K. for about three months. But then after that, I started started my PhD. Yeah. What did you focus on for your research? So I sort of looked at sea level rise and coastal flooding along the south coast of England. Okay. We digitized a lot of old tide gauge records. The, the tide gauge records there were very short. So we managed to extend the records back sort of about 100 years. And then we looked at how much sea level had risen along the south coast of the UK and how flooding, the frequency of flooding had changed. Was it a combination of data-driven stuff with some modeling as well? or was it? The- Originally, we were going to do data and modeling, but the data... Uh, analysis was so time consuming and collecting and digitizing all this data that in the end we focus mo- mainly on a sort of data analysis. Gotcha. Really interesting and I mean now it's, it seems like every year sea level rise becomes more and more in the news and, yeah. and you were yeah. kind of in the early part of I think about 15-20 years ago people were really starting to to analyze this more yeah. and talk about it yeah. more. No so a lot of the work I've done 
in the last sort of, 10 years has been looking at we, we know sea levels are rising but is there's been quite a bit of debate about is that rate actually accelerating and so quite a lot of my work has been looking at you know showing that yes that, you know not only are sea levels rising but that rate is every year getting faster and faster and faster yeah and that's some combination of thermal expansion of the water and also a lot of land-based ice melting is, is that yeah those are the two main components and then also sort of changes in water storage on land is the sort of third main component that sort of contributes to that um, yeah. uh, how concerned is the uk um with rising seas moving ahead yeah i mean th- the uk is very concerned i mean we are lucky that we have you know quite a bit of money and we've got very good f- you know in places we've got very good flood defenses but there's just no way that we can you know defend all of the coastline and and we have you know london one of the most f- biggest coastal cities in the world you know has almost more than one million people more than 275 billion pounds of infrastructure you know hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of railway roads something like 400 schools 400 hospitals all sort of in the it within the floodplain um yeah so very susceptible and potentially some pretty high impacts there yeah i mean luckily uh you know london has this amazing uh, you know one and a half billion pound tidal defense system called the thames barrier and and along with that hundreds of kilometers of seawall so london is you know relatively well defended but, you know, as sea levels arise, we're going to have to increase those defences. We're going to have to rebuild a new Thames barrier at some point. Is the Thames barrier, is it like a moving gate? Does it, does it open and close? So the, the Thames barrier has sort of 10, 10 gates. Sev- seven of them are very big and sit on the seabed. And then they're rotated up into place during a storm. So the Thames barrier closes five or six times a year. And sort of, sort of to protect London from flooding. I'm supposing uh, it w- this would be like big winter storms, especially, right? Yeah. So yeah. the North Sea is one of the the most susceptible to storm surges. So the the North Sea gets very shallow in the south, and so the sort of storm surge can really build up and funnel, and it funnels into the Thames. So you sort of get nothing like hurricanes, but you get sort of two meter storm surges, sure. which certainly for the UK is is very big. Yeah, for sure. And obviously, a lot of the talks we've heard at the event conferences over the years even talk about some of these storm surges in northern Germany and getting into the Baltic area as well. Yep, yep. Um, so you really kind of got an early start on some of that sea level rise stuff in northern Europe there. But then after that, sounds like you made another big move internationally, right? Yeah. So I, I was, again, after my PhD, I genuinely, well, during my PhD, I had generally no idea what I was going to do. But I mean, it's funny how life changes sort of in very small moments. But I went to a international conference in Hamburg, uh, a very big, about a thousand people go to the ICCE conference, the International Coastal Engineering Conference. And I just happened to meet a professor called Chari Padarachi from Australia, Sri Lankan, very lovely Sri Lankan man. But he was looking for a postdoc to sort of work on tropical cyclone related sort of storm surges. So I actually just bumped into him. I did a talk in the same session as him and he sort of came to me afterwards and sort of said, would I be interested in moving to Australia and working with him for three years? And at first I said no, actually, but he sort of contacted me a few months later and and my wife and I sort of um, had a sort of chat and decided, actually, yeah, this is something we really wanted to do. So, yeah, we moved to Australia for three years. I think you said it was like a Friday and you had to make a decision by, by Sunday. It was a short amount of time and you guys just decided, like, let's try Yeah, it, right? well, originally, yeah, originally Chari had e- emailed me and I sort of thought about it, but... I, we just didn't quite feel ready to yeah. move at that point. Uh, it was a big move, but he contacted me again, sort of three or four months later, just towards the end of my PhD. And I, yeah, it was on a Friday, and I sort of emailed him back with lots of questions. And I said, "Well, when do you need to know?" And he said, "By Monday morning." Yeah. So my wife and I sort of went home, and we didn't sleep very much those two nights. We sort of spent all two days sort of going you know should we do this shouldn't we do this but yeah it's one of the best decisions we, we made it seems like you and fiona are pretty adventurous and we'll, we'll uh, like you know from your around the world trip together and yeah, things like that. yeah you know this story kind of parallels what thomas wall was saying at this conference how you know he went to a conference as a student and how you know that one person you meet can yeah. change the course of your professional yeah, career yeah. and your whole life yeah. right because it seems to be a common theme maybe um, for young professionals to hear about that, you know, the importance of going to a conference and networking and yeah. even just that, that one person you meet, like in your case, all yeah. of a sudden open up the door to do a postdoc yeah. in Australia. No, d- definitely. And and at that exact same conference, I actually met Thomas Wall. And um, um, yeah, we he sort of emailed me about a month later and we... And um, over the last sort of 15 years, he's become one of my, well, one of my very, very closest friends. And we've written lots and lots of journal papers together, collaborated a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, 
so yeah I, and it's something that I've always loved my favorite part of conferences is the sort of meeting people and talking to people and yeah so so um it worked out for you to do a postdoc in Australia you and and Fiona flew down there what was that like showing up in western Australia it's fairly remote out there in a sense right well we had been to Australia but we'd never we had driven we'd spent sort of four months driving the east coast but we'd never been to the west coast we didn't know anything about it and we yeah it was a um it was quite an interesting journey because I handed in my PhD on the Friday we sort of finished packing up the house on the Saturday and we flew on the Sunday and I started work pretty much straight away um, but we only took one suitcase each so we we decided you, you know we, we we went very light so it, it was quite after it was quite refreshing actually just to go to a new country and and start start again and, and for us it was more personal actually we we had been married we got married very young and we'd been together we'd been married about sort of eight years uh, pr- probably 10 years actually and we had really struggled with infertility and so we had been trying for a baby for about five years and a lot of our friends were having kids and we my wife in particular but but myself as well really struggling so for us going to Australia was a bit of a sort of fresh start and you know a bit of a healing process and and yeah um, yeah Ivan thanks for sharing that sometimes I know um, you know we have this idea of where we want life to go and sometimes it's not going there and yeah, it seems yeah. like you you made a choice to take a different opportunity yeah so time. for us I think it was just a bit of a fresh start and and um, have a, we had been doing some quite intensive fertility treatments and it was very painful and hard work so for us it was lovely just to yeah, kind go to a, a different country and have a bit different. of a new beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, and you were there for several years, huh? We were there for three years. Yeah, we loved it. It was one of the best three years of my life. And we, you know, we we lived in a we lived in one of the most expensive suburbs in Australia. We we had a flat that was about a meter square by a meter square, but we were right on the beach. And, and so you were we, there in Perth, right? We were in Perth. Yeah, I think you said yeah. you swam every day of the year. Is that right? Yeah. So I I love the sea. I've always loved swimming. So I set myself a challenge. So one year I well I I swam almost every day for three years, but one year I actually swam every single day, three hundred sixty five days of the year. Wow, that's fantastic! So you were yeah. right there on the Indian Ocean in Perth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And right by the beach, I've heard the beaches are amazing. Right? Yeah, the beaches are beautiful there, really beautiful. And when yeah. you get north of Perth, Perth, and you get pretty remote pretty quickly, right? When you start driving up the coast, yeah. Yeah, so we drove all the way up to Ningaloo Reef. It took us two or three days, sort of, you know, 16, 17 hours of driving. But it's, yeah, it's really interesting. It's very barren, very desolate. And You were telling uh, us they would sell this atlas or this book of maps, and it was a waste of money, right? Because there's like <laughs> there's one road, it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And we really wanted to go to Sharks Bay. And I remember we sort of turned off and it was a sort of two hour drive to Shark Bay. And it's one of the most beautiful bays in the world, but there's absolutely no one there. And they have stromatolites, which is the sort of world's oldest living organism. I remember thinking if this was in Europe or America, there'd be like half a million tourists coming through here, like, you know, every week. And there's about three of us at this sort of place, you know, seeing this sort of. You know, kind of. So you're in these like unbelievable natural settings, yeah. and just a few people enjoying yeah, we, it because yeah. it's so remote. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they obviously do get a lot of tropical cyclones there in um in in um, their summer. I guess like January, February, March, right? Um, yeah. So we where we were, um, you do get the sort of remnants of cyclones, but up north, you know, particularly in the oil and gas sort of fields up there, they get a lot of yeah, some of the most intense cyclones in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then even. Um, Ivan, as far as the journey back to the UK then, after your postdoc, how did that look? Yeah, so we, again, I really didn't know what, what to do. We we really loved Australia and we were tempted to stay, but we, we eventually got pregnant um, there and had a baby. And my wife in particular really missed her mother and wanted to be a bit closer to home. Um, oh, and was Ren born in Australia? Ren, yeah, Ren was born in Australia. I didn't know that, huh? And so, again, sort of quite luckily, but the oceanography center back in Southampton was advertising for a coastal oceanographer so I I applied for that and 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 got the job so I've moved back and yeah I've been back in Southampton University for 10 years you now. know what's interesting your 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 life path has these geographic zigzags but in in a sense when you look at it, it you're really moving in the in the same direction in a sense doing similar overlapping research and, and things like that as well yeah. you know yeah. I've been at conferences I consistently hear people say that your presentations are among their favorites you know what advice do you have for especially young scientists on I mean how do you get Give such engaging presentations I, I've been to literally hundreds of conferences and and I find I come away and I find that I actually really don't remember any of the talks there may be one or two talks that stick in my head and and I'm always surprised at actually how often conferences have relatively poor quality talks so I sort of made it a bit of a mission to try and be the one or two talks that people would actually remember but 
I put a huge amount of work into my talk, so I, you know, I spend a lot of time preparing them. I think very carefully about the color schemes. I, and more than anything, I practice. So even though I've given thousands of talks, every conference that I go to, I'll often lock myself into the hotel room two or three nights before, and I'll, I'll run through the talk standing in front of a mirror. And actually practice myself. If it's a long half an hour talk, I won't. But if it's a sort of ten minute talk, I'll practice the talk ten or fifteen times in a row until it sort of almost flows out of me. So that's yeah. really important because you're you're such a um, well known researcher and professor. A lot of, a lot of people could just say, "Oh, I know, I know what I'm doing. I'm not gonna. There's no need to practice." But it yeah. sounds like still you you'll still practice yeah, your so, talks. Uh, some yeah, and students are often surprised that I do that. But I still um, yeah, if it's if it's you know a talk I've done a number of times and it's longer I don't practice but if it's a 10 minute talk or you know roughly I'll, I'll still practice 10 15 sometimes even 20 times before the the, the conference I've been two last questions for you um where where do you see yourself going uh, ahead into your research and um you know your work moving into the future Yeah sure so I think what what I love more than anything is is actually the sort of interface between research and policy so I've slowly in the last couple of years been transitioning a little bit to doing more sort of government advice policy sort of roles but but still within research so at the moment I've I've actually got a 3 year fellowship where I'm working 50% of my time with the Dutch and the UK governments on helping them think through how sort of climate change will impact particularly storm surge barriers so increasingly I'd love to do more of that sort of government advisory role I've I've also started doing a a small project with the US Army Corps of Engineers looking at some of their storm surge barriers in Galveston where you're from and so I'm hoping to do more and more of that and but yeah obviously I still really love the research and very much want to continue on that yeah and i could see there being a big need for that um as far as your background with experience but as you get more into policy and and international work i think uh, your insights will be very valuable and the very last question i have for you just uh what's one last thing you'd like to share especially with some young scientists you know that are just starting out maybe they're in undergraduate or just uh, maybe thinking about graduate school or even younger than that just you know maybe thinking about a career in the sciences any advice you have for them yeah i mean you know just go for it (laughs) Um, you know, if you, you you know if you get an opportunity to do a PhD, you know, I really encourage you to do it. And what I would say is, for me, probably the thing that benefited more than anything was sort of talking to people. And so one thing I did a lot with my PhD is, if I came across an interesting journal paper, I contacted the author. And so I would say, you know, if you want to do a PhD, don't even wait for one to be advertised. You know, find professors around the world that are working on interesting things and just email them. And, you know, you know, contact them and, you know, see if they have any openings. So I would say that's, you know, something I'd really encourage people to do. Um, but, yeah, no matter how diverse you are, what background you are, you know, being a scientist is a very uh, rewarding thing. Yeah, that's great advice about finding that professor or finding those researchers yeah. or the topic that you're passionate about. Yeah. Because graduate school is this long road yeah. through a lot of work. If you don't love what you're doing, yeah. you're not going to have the motivation. I'd say there's two things. One is you've got to love what you're doing. And two is you've got to enjoy working with working with the, the sort of the professor in the group so I think yeah. those two are equally important and something things. I think we saw at this year's event conference just people I just noticed at the dinner and in the breakout times people just really enjoy this is a community and group of people that enjoy spending time together yeah. and yeah. it really the, the community of it really stood out to me you yeah. know that these are yeah. people that work together collaborate together yeah. share ideas yeah. and that science it really isn't something we do alone you know yeah. it's the yeah. more collaborative you can be I think the better and yeah. I, I think that's yeah. why these conferences have been so successful yeah. no definitely Ivan thank you so much for taking cool time to come on the podcast best wishes to you and uh, i always learn a lot from you i I thought we had a great conference this year and i'm looking forward to the next one which will be in venice italy right? yeah really exciting yeah thanks ivan appreciate you taking time to come on the podcast thanks al Wow. Thank you so much, Ivan, for coming on the podcast, sharing those profound insights and for sharing about your life as well. It was a real pleasure to kind of follow you through your professional path there. I like to go deep with our podcast guests and cover angles of their life that others may not see. When we were recording this podcast in the park, I forgot to ask Ivan about his passion for NBA basketball. So we recorded this bonus clip a few hours later while we were driving around Orlando, Florida in a rental car. And we're back here with Ivan Haig. Ivan, something I forgot to ask you in the previous segment we recorded. You are an NBA fanatic. How did you become so obsessed with NBA basketball? I absolutely love NBA. It's literally my favorite sport. And I hate living in the UK because of the time difference. So I wake up every morning and literally the first thing I do is 
spend about 20 minutes watching all of the NBA highlights from the games the night before. Yeah, when um, you told me you like NBA, I didn't realize you know like all the players. I mean, you start your day with the NBA. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know I know all the players. I know, yeah, I mean, I, I, I watch a lot of NBA. Do you yeah. have a player in particular that's your favorite or favorite team? I mean, of growing up, I was a massive Chicago Bulls fan, as you can imagine, sort of Michael Jordan and I. So I've sort of stayed faithful to to Chicago, and it's nice to kind of see the Bulls doing, you know, better again. So what, your school growing up was it pretty international? Were there? Did you get exposed to like American culture, basketball, that kind of thing? So our school was very, very international. We had kind of people from all over the world. And it had a very American sort of influence. The teachers weren't American, so I don't really know where that came from. But, yeah, there was quite a strong American influence. So we listened to a lot of American music. So I grew up kind of listening to Tupac and Notorious B.I.G. and um, Wu-Tang Clan and um, Bone Thugs and Harmony. And then we, yeah, there was a massive basketball culture. So we had, you know, sort of basketball court at our school and, you know, after school I'd play for three or four hours a day on the weekend I'd often play for six or seven hours a day so we played a lot a lot of basketball and yeah just loved it well Ivan I knew that you loved basketball but I did not realize how deep your passion for the NBA was until we started talking about it on this last trip when the mic was off Ivan shared this really funny anecdote I have to share with y'all He said when he grew up playing hoops in Africa, it was really kind of rough. I mean, there'd be a lot of trash talk on the court. And then when he transitioned to university in the UK, it was suddenly like really different. Like people were really polite. No one talked trash. He said that was a bit of a transition. I wish I could get in a time machine and see Ivan, see the African version of Ivan Haig show up at 18, 19 years old, playing hoops, talking trash in the UK, and just, just seeing how that went down. I think it would be highly entertaining. But um, yeah, you had a very cross-cultural life, living in different places. And Ivan, we really appreciate everything you shared with us. In this podcast, we followed Ivan's journey as he grew up in Zambia, Africa, to his introduction to oceanography through university studies and professional work in Southampton, United Kingdom. Then we followed the trip around the world that Ivan took with his wife Fiona and heard how they were nearly victims of the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami in Thailand. They went back to the UK after the trip around the world where Ivan did his doctoral research and then on to Western Australia where Ivan and Fiona lived for several years in Perth. Ivan made his way back to Southampton, United Kingdom, where he is now an associate professor in coastal oceanography at the University of Southampton. Ivan shared a lot of wisdom in this podcast. I want to revisit two valuable perspectives that he shared. The first is when he encouraged students and young professionals to reach out to experts in fields they want to study. Young people with an interest in a career in science can feel overwhelmed about what to study and what path to take. Dr. Haig gave advice to find something that interests you and then take initiative to reach out to experts in that field as opposed to just being passive and waiting for some opportunity to open up. Most academics like professors and university staff love talking about their research. They'll take time to guide prospective students and young professionals. Reaching out to others will also open up opportunities for you to understand what the most urgent problems in society are, and that's where funding is gonna be attached. So where you find these urgent problems that society needs to address, you'll often find funding attached to that, and you'll often find opportunities attached to that. Often these are not covered in the mainstream media, and you might not have a good idea of these specific problems that you can work with until you start really talking to people that are in the middle of the action. The second perspective that I thought was very insightful was how Dr. Haig shared how much he practices new presentations. He said he'll often run through new presentations many times, like more than 10 times, often in front of a mirror until the presentation really flows. This explains how he gives such engaging lectures and presentations and is such a popular speaker at conferences and on the media. When talking about presentations, Ivan mentioned that many speakers at conferences and workshops actually do not stand out and they may not be remembered by the audience. Practicing your presentation can help you deliver it more smoothly. It can also help you remember more facts so you don't have to write as much text on your slides. Presentations that have more video clips, images, maps, and photos are much more engaging than those that are filled with text. So the more you practice, the less text you need to have on your slides. The next time you go to a conference or workshop, make a note in your journal about the one or two presentations that stand out to you. 
What did they say or do that made their presentation more memorable than the others? At GeoTrack, we're passionate about communicating science to the public, so we see a lot of value in podcasts like this one with Dr. Ivan Haig. Hey, if you have a favorite science personality, like a professor, local meteorologist, or someone working in marine and ocean sciences, give us a shout and tell us about them. We'd love to feature them as guests on a future episode of the GeoTrek podcast. We not only have a passion for science, but in great science communication. Ivan, thanks again for taking time to come on the podcast. Best wishes to you, and we're excited to follow your career as you move forward. On behalf of the GeoTrek production team, this is Dr. Hal Needham signing off until the next episode of the GeoTrek podcast. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Hal. Thank you so much for listening to the GeoTrek podcast. If you're wondering how we come up with such interesting topics each week, we rely on an amazing global community to help direct our scientific fieldwork, articles, and podcasts. If you have an idea for a topic or can connect us to an outstanding future podcast guest, please reach out to us on our website at geo-trek.com or on our Facebook group called GeoTrek The Community. On behalf of our GeoTrek production team, this is Dr. Hal. I'll catch you on the next episode of the GeoTrek podcast.